Chris, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's been a real pleasure to have you in the, at the Intermedia Conference. Um, and it's great to have you for this interview because it's going to be very enlightening for our students who may use this material for training, especially because although we've worked on re-speaking, real-time voice writing for a long time here, uh, well, not really as long as you, but if, for what it feels like a long time, it's always been very much about Europe, maybe Australia, um, and when we looked up things about re-speaking in the US, we simply couldn't find anything. But of course, we got the wrong word, right? Because <laughs> right? it was real-time voice writing. Right. So we're very interested in finding out more about your approach and the differences. Um, could you tell us, just to start with, your beginning, the origins of this, when you started, because you're very much a key player in the beginning of what you call voice writing, real-time voice writing in the US. Tell us a little bit about it. Um, I started my career as a court reporter, and I, I was reading about the fact that computer-aided transcription was on the horizon, and when I found... And when you were a court reporter, what method were you using for court? Um, at that point, I was just recording. I was speaking into a mask. Right. I was recording. I would take the recording. I would bring it back to my office, and I would spend days producing a 300-page transcript. Wow. And I was looking forward to the day when I could just produce a transcript right on the spot, and then just simply clean it up and format it and have it ready to go. And what, when did you start doing your reporting in, in this kind of first 1998. What, without the computer, I mean, just the without normal recording. The computer. You started like that, yeah. I started like that. Okay. Um, Dragon came out. <clears throat> it was actually 3.5. Um, very rough. But uh, I needed to make it work. I'm one of those people that uh, if I th have a thought in my head, if something, if I can make it do something, how would I make it do it? And what do I want to make it look like? And so uh, what I would do while I was court reporting uh, is keep a notepad next to me. And on the notepad, as I watched my text drop, I would notice that there was a certain pattern to words that would transcribe and words that wouldn't transcribe. I would also notice that um, I would need to use pauses very frequently because of the fact that the engine was thinking about what I was saying and it needed time to like digest the words. And so it's at that point that I, be I began building um, a theory I needed a theory, I needed a way to make my transcription more accurate because more accurate equated less time to produce that 300 page transcript. And at that point you were still not showing your text live? No. 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 You're at that producer? point yeah. it was just me. Um, about 1999 I heard of Audioscribe and I was thrilled and um, went to Louisiana, and uh, I uh, became a trainer for AudioScribe. And, and then it's at that time that I'm thinking after I started that, well, I think it was version four, Dragon. So every time there was a new version, I was the first one there to get it. I wanted that new version, because I was always hoping to see the improvements and so working with version 4 with Dragon and AudioScribe, again, lots of note taking, lots of observation and dissection of how does Dragon feed into SpeechCat and how can I use SpeechCat to augment some of the shortages that I'm that Dragon is producing. As a, as a side note, Chris, just for our viewers, um, AudioScribe is SpeechCat. SpeechCat yes. and SpeechCat is the um, business layer or the second, uh, the, the technology used on top of Dragon to augment accuracy, which will be described by Chad Terrier um, in, in another interview. Correct. Thank you. That's correct. Um, so my notes began to build and build and then I turned that into a book. I turned it into a theory because I found that <clears throat> for words that sounded alike, 
First of all, I had to build a lot of profiles because I ended up corrupting a lot of profiles with the thoughts. You know, I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll do this in Dragon. And it didn't quite work out in Dragon because any time that you mess with Dragon's hard coding, eventually the, pr the program is going to corrupt. And if I added too many words, eventually the program would go, ah, you know, I, I, I think I understand you, but I'm not really sure that I understand it's this word because I already have this word in my vocabulary. Why are you putting it again? And why are you- Too much manipulation. Too much, yeah. And so um, I came up with a very simple theory that was consistent and standard that could be used by everybody, which was the suffix of Mac. I didn't want to create an, a shorthand voice language. I wanted to keep the beginning of the word and just add Mac. So I take the less used word, for instance, one and, and O-N-E, and W-O-N. Mm -hmm. W-O-N is used way less yes. than one. Yeah. So I want the recognition engine to learn that I'm always going to say one. Number one. Right. And when I say one Mac, it's always going to be W-O-N. Brilliant. What ultimately happens is sometimes you forget, but the engine remembers. And so it's more forgiving because it's got that context. It's like, okay, she should have said one Mac, but we know it's W-O-N, so we're gonna, we're gonna put that down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's, it, I started doing that, and then I, I, uh, I wrote a book, and uh, gave a lot of seminars, and I taught. And that's, I think, when my teaching, when I started traveling to different states, and I started teaching people how to use the software. And things have changed because, I mean, when you started, I would imagine that there was um, a ratio, a completely different ratio of stenographers to voice writers, to real-time voice writers. That's now completely changed, I would imagine. Um, uh, back at that time, uh, steno writers dominated the market. It was unheard of that um, a voice writer using real-time recognition would be able to meet the standard of a steno writer. And there's always been this dissension between NCRA and NVRA. And uh, so I was fighting against that, the two factions. I really, it, it didn't play into what I was doing because I was interested in forging another path because I could see the future and the future was going to be voice. And so further development, as each version came out and as uh, Chad uh, and Adria were kind enough to let me work with the programmer, I could tell them, okay, I need, I need to be able to do this. Is there a way that we can do this? And they would think about it and I would talk to the programmer and they would say, yeah, yeah, we could do it, we could do it. And then I would take that, and then I wrote another book. <laughs> and now we fast forward to the present, then you've got your course yes. that the students take. Yeah. Um, tell us roughly, I mean, the basics of it, how long it takes and how many people you, you teach every year. Um, are these people all over the US or maybe in other countries around the world? Is this US focused, as in for US captions? Um, the course is uh, directed toward people that want to graduate and work, okay? They, they, they don't want to spend $15,000 in tuition at a school. Um, I be, I'm a true believer that if you're going to teach voice writing, you need to be doing it because otherwise you, you can't foresee the, the pitfalls that um, a new student is going to run into. And the course encompasses um, learning about deaf culture, first off, why are you doing this? Um, if you make that commitment when I talk to you and I determine that after I speak to you that you would probably make a good voice writer because I'm assessing your voice as I'm talking to you, um, 
then you need to come at it as more than a, a career. It needs to be a mission. It needs to be something that you're going to care about because at the very end of your service is a person that can't hear and they are relying upon you and so you need to take it very seriously. So they learn about deaf culture. Um, the next thing they learn about after uh, that is um, they learn about dragon because dragon is your mechanical if you were a steno writer, I would equate that to your steno machine. Tool, yeah. It's your tool. And so you need to know your tool inside and out. And you need to know how to manipulate the words. You need to know um, uh, not to delete certain things and to delete certain things. You need to know to uncheck certain things that aren't needed, that are going to slow the engine down. Um, so that's the next step. And at that point, they start dictating a little bit. I just give them just a taste because it's at that point that I'm going to assess them just by what they're, they're able to do. And I get back, sometimes I will just get back one old big old long paragraph. Well, I know that person's going to require a lot of work. And then other times, a student will surprise me. I'll get commas, and I'll get periods, and I'll say, OK, this student has real promise because they're already thinking in their mind. They're already formulating that sentence, well, those sentences. And so they're, they're thinking about that. Are these people graduates, postgraduates? Do they come from, do they need to have a degree? They don't need to have a degree. No, some do. Some have an associate, some have a bachelor's, some are um, singers. Um, I have taught uh, radio show hosts. Um, I had a woman, uh, Frances Dobson, fly in from the UK to work with me. I work with people not only online, but if they feel the need that they need to spend a week with me or two weeks, they'll fly in and um, I'll create a plan for them. Uh, First, I find out what is most important to them, what is going to be their objective, what do they want to walk away with, what topics do they want me to touch on, because I'm, I'm one for not wasting time. I, they get really frustrated if I'm going off on my own tangent and not listening to them as to what they're looking to get from me. And are there, how long does it take, roughly, to, to, to get training? Okay, depending on uh, their um, technological skills, yeah. their understanding of computers, um, the way they speak, the way that they're able to, you know, memorize. Uh, it could be three months for somebody that's highly skilled technically. They get that listen and repeat. They get that down right away. They. Um, I teach them to create their own word journals, their own problem words, because everybody's different. They're not going to have the same problem I do. I'm not going to have the same problem that they do. Um, three months. Then I've had somebody, it took a year, but that was because they didn't commit to practicing. There wasn't, they, they would miss class with me. I have class once a week with them, one-on-one. -on -one. I will walk them through each process. I set up Dragon. I set up SpeechCat. We upload vocabularies. They're, the student is literally all set up and ready to go. Uh, that's one thing that I like about SpeechCat is everything is portable and interchangeable. So I can create it, and then I can share it. Yeah. Um, okay. And Apart from your course, is voice writing not taught at universities in the UK, in, in, in the US, universities or other schools? I mean, is that not? To be, to be honest with you, yes. They, there, there's Brown College that teaches it. It's a, an associate's degree course. Um, there, are, the teachers, the instructors are not voice writers. Uh, there's Cuyahoga Community College. Um, and the only reason I know that is because ultimately a graduate will come to me for a job. I'm usually in a position to find somebody work or I'm working for a company at the time where they might need a voice writer. And um, I will say, OK, well, before I send you to this company, you have to do a test for me. You say you're 99% in the school. This shouldn't be a problem. Um, you have to do a 30-minute news show. 
and you have to record it or I'll record it. And then if you are 97, 98% accurate, then I will refer you to a company and they will assess you their own. They, each company has a different assessment. Yeah. I just give them the nuts and the bolts of it. Here's what you can expect. And if they can pass that, then you know I'll refer them. Most of the time, people that come from community colleges cannot do 30 minutes. There's, their testing at the 99% is a five minute test. You can't determine anything in five minutes. But, um, Chris, from what you've seen uh, today, yesterday, all these days here, um, what are the main differences that you've noticed um, in what is a common, I mean, very similar profession, but approach maybe differently? So, where, where are those differences? What, what do you think? I don't know that there is that many actually when uh, I was really excited when um, everybody was demonstrating the way that you were teaching is basically the same thing that I'm doing. There's just different terminology that we use. You're more academia where I am more focused on the individual getting a job. That's the biggest difference. Um, at the end of your course, you've developed um, lyrics, which I'm very interested in because um, and I'm thinking about the big picture now. I have over 50 people that are voice writers that I would love for them to be certified internationally because I'm thinking the world is a smaller place now. If you need an English speaking person in Poland, they don't have to fly to Poland. They can do it from America. They can provide that English translation for you and vice versa. In, in America, we need French, we need Spanish, we need Chinese, we need Arabic. And I can now, with the connections that I've made here, I actually am creating a network where I can say, ah, I know somebody who can provide French or Spanish captioning. Okay. Um, languages then, Chris, um, you are training people to voice write in English. In English. Um, who's training uh, people in other languages? Nobody. What do you mean? There is no program that I know of in America that teaches, what is it, intralingual from English to Spanish that teaches it. No way. Okay, so there's no inter. Lingua, uh, uh, interlingual from one language to another um, in terms of training. Right. But how about Spanish to Spanish captioning? Not needed and not done? It's or? very much needed and very much in demand, but very few people provide it. And most of the people that are providing it right now are steno writers, are Spanish speaking steno writers, French speaking steno writers. Yes. And what about Spanish speaking? Voice there writers? are a few Spanish speaking voice writers, but there are no schools that I know of that would have trained them. They probably learned English, okay? And then it's very easy. Once you learn a theory, yeah. you just simply speak your language and you, you, you go from there. And I think that's how it's being done. And so you think there's more of a demand for intralingual voice yeah. writing Spanish Spanish than there would be for interlingual writing? Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. definitely. That's interesting, very interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, I don't know if, Chris, is there anything else that we haven't touched upon? Um, I don't, I can't really think of anything. I, I think that uh, the United States and the UK and, and the EU were all really close uh, in line with one another. We're, we're on the same playing field. And I think this is a great opportunity for us all to think outside the box. And you haven't been, you haven't been to, to Europe to talk about this, right? First no, time? this is no. my first time in Europe to discuss this and my first time seeing how everything is put together. The only thing that I I, I'm always, because I'm coming at it from a business perspective, when we were discussing yesterday how there's four people to produce, okay. So, I, so I'm, just to, to, to make it clear for Just you, to make it clear. To make it clear for the people who are watching the interview, you're referring to the um, setup uh, for intra or we speaking in France, when there's three or four people look at producing and looking at the live title before they queue it out with, right. the, with very much uh, with a lot of accuracy, but with a lot of delay. 
right? So, there, when I was looking at the screen yesterday, I counted a 10 second to 15 second delay and they were really behind, which we get a lot of complaints when we're that far behind in the United States. They, the uh, reader loses context. They're, they're already on a different subject and they're trying to read the subject that was above them. And so we, that is our biggest complaint from consumers is you guys are too far behind. Uh, we lost, we lost you. We, we can't follow the show. And uh, I think that um, because we're hearing most of the population is completely oblivious to what it's like to not be able to hear and to have any empathy or compassion for people that don't hear. Because the, your average person, depending on when they lost their hearing, if it's before they learned to speak, they can't read English that well. Uh, it's very difficult for them. But then Chris, if that's a fact, and if, um, say, severe, profoundly deaf viewers um, may not be able to read as fast as some hearing people, Correct. then would they not find it difficult to read fully verbatim subtitles that are displayed very fast? Absolutely. So there's a bit of a contradiction there between obviously demanding verbatim so as not to have any censorship in between, right. but at the same time struggling or not being able to fully follow super fast subtitles. What do you think about this? I think that, it, that it's a real disparity. Um, I don't agree with it. Um, I think that the FCC has too much control. Um, I think that the big companies in America are the ones that are driving the industry standards right now. And I don't think that, um, well, because of the, the, the steno writer faction, where they are the ones that are driving verbatim. Oh, I see. Okay. So it all comes from the right. court reporting tradition and the fact that stenographers are normally verbatim. It comes from that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you see that changing or slightly being modified at any point? I mean, the fact that the um, stress on the, the on verbatim captures may be slightly relaxed, or is that very difficult? Um, right now it's very difficult. Do I see it happening in the future? It just depends. It depends on will voice phase out steno. I think that will happen. I don't think it will happen for another two to five years where steno will be obsolete. I know I'm going to get really beat on because of this, but I'm used to it and, and it will be phased out. And, uh, and voice will be in. It's just like when I started my career. I started as a Greg writer. Do you know what a Greg writer is? A Greg writer is a person that takes symbols. Shorthand. Yes. Uh -huh. Shorthand. That's what I used to do. And I used to be able to produce a transcript at 180 words a minute. That was the test. Okay, in, in the state I'm in, the state certified you at 180 words per minute. Then came along the good old steno machine and phased me out. So because I didn't want to learn the steno machine, okay, I went on to voice writing and then the steno machines got bigger and better, but then it got harder and it got really expensive to graduate a steno student. And so now you have all of these students that are Let's face it, our millennials are very technical, okay? They're very computer savvy. It makes more sense to them to use voice than it makes sense to go and learn a machine shorthand that's going to be phased out. Then again, will automatic subtitling phase you out? I think eventually. Uh, I think it will phase out maybe um, the need for... I don't see as being completely phased out. I still, I still see that need for a, a working human component person in there because a computer will never ever be able to replace our logic and environmental noises. There's so much to relay to a deaf and hard of hearing person. I guess it comes down to a degree so you could say, will we have uh, machine-aided human-made captions or human-aided machine-made captions? I don't know what role we'll play there. Right. I guess we'll play some sort of role there. We will, yeah. <laughs> Chris, it's been a real, real pleasure to have you. 
Thank you. And to start building some kind of bridges between. between it's been great. Countries. Yeah, I've learned a lot. Thank <laughs> you so much for inviting me, Pablo. So have we, and uh, we hope the, the viewers will too. Thank you very much, Chris. You're welcome.